Ron, I'm going to invite Ron Meyer to come up today. Many of you know Ron, some of you that are fairly new. He comes about every September, so yeah, yeah. it's been about a year. So if you're new to Grace, Ron will be new to you. And uh, say whatever you want, Ron. What a joy to be here. Wow. <laughs> Not sure what to do with the emotions. Mm. But they're powerful. What a joy and a privilege to be before you this morning. You know, I, I love what all God's doing here in, in Grace, Food Bank, Clothing Bank, Shelter, Deliverance Ministries, thrift store, all those kind of things. But the real horsepower is right here in this room. It's you, individuals, sent by God to influence this region with his kingdom. When Jesus sent out the 12, the 70, the 120, he didn't send him out to talk about ministry. He didn't send him out to teach about ministry. He didn't send him out to develop a political system. He didn't send him out to develop an earthly kingdom. Or he sent him out to declare the kingdom of God. Matthew 10 says what he sent them out. He sent them out and he said, Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. I'm not sure exactly when things shifted and it became about me. It became about us. It became about what's good for us. If we were to model Christ's life here on earth, I think we could narrow it down to four things. Walk in submission to the Father, focus on others, emptying of yourself, and declaring the kingdom of God. Anytime someone was healed, Jesus said, declare to them the kingdom of God is near you. This is what's available for you. This is what he has for you. As I said, I'm not sure when it turned into what's in it for me. I have a good friend named Harold Eberly who his life goal, his life purpose shifted probably 20 years ago. He was establishing Bible schools in Africa and the Lord laid on his heart for the Muslim nations of the world. He set out a life goal of I forget how many millions you wanted to see reach for the gospel. Two years ago, that goal was met, and he upped the goal a lot higher, and I forget how many million it was. Harold said this. He said, when people come to the kingdom in a Muslim nation, they don't accept or adopt Western Christianity. And he describes Western Christianity, and this is not meant to be offensive, but he describes Western Christianity as making Jesus or accepting Jesus as your savior and looking at what's in it for me. He said on a crusade when a Muslim raises hand to accept Jesus as Lord, they know that they will probably be beaten three times within the next few days. First time on the way home, second time by the family after they are home and probably at some point in time by other religious leaders 
So he said, I know when that hand goes up and they make Jesus Lord of their life, they do it for one reason, because they know that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords over all the universe. And they are submitting their lives to his lordship, whether it costs their life, no matter the price, they know and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. When I was 12, I asked Jesus into my heart. I'd love Jesus, loved him then, grew up in a godly home, was the different one in school, wasn't invited to parties, that kind of thing. One teacher called me the Holy Roller. And yet there was a time in 19, about 1983, I listened to a message on lordship. And I began to ask myself, what would be the hardest thing for me to do or to give up that I know that Jesus is Lord of my life and I'd be willing to sacrifice that for him? Within five seconds, I knew exactly what it was. And at that point in time, I had to decide, would I be willing? It was a business venture I was involved in. Would I be willing to face the humility to give that up? not only the desire and the passion that I had for it. And I remember standing there, my wife, and two children beside me, and I made that declaration, Lord, you are Lord, and I'm willing to give up anything and everything for you. And I walked down the aisle, and one of the guys, the guy at the front was a guy that I was working with. I was, I was... <laughs> I don't know if I was leading a small group or was assisting a small group at that point in time. And he looked at me and he said, Ron, what's this? Why are you here? Obviously, I know that you're saved. I know you. I said, I just wanted to drive a stake tonight that I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I would give up anything and everything because he is Lord of my life. He is king of my life. And I'm willing to surrender everything to him. Romans 10, 9 says, If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confession is such a powerful thing. Public declaration is such a powerful thing. We may give opportunity at the end for public declaration because... There's something so powerful about just standing and saying, I declare Jesus Christ as Lord of my life. Listen, if we can't do it in this setting, we'll never be able to do it out there. And there is something so powerful about that. My life was forever changed at that moment. Not that it became easy. Not that it became less stressful. Not that it became without trial and difficulty. But I never question my salvation or being right with God. Because I knew without a shadow of a doubt, he was Lord of my life. I felt to do something different this morning. What I want to do today, unless you'd like to play the whole time, that's entirely up to you. <laughs> play the whole time. I want to just thank you for your presence. so tender <sighs> guys soak this in because this isn't something you reproduce this isn't something we say well if we sing these songs next service or I have no idea what next service will do but know this this is a special time the Holy Spirit has created for you vacations are over guys it's September things are Starting up again, things are cranking. And I really felt this morning, <laughs> it was 15 minutes before the service start that I come up with my message title. I told Alan, he said, what do you want to call it? I said, call it the sent ones. 
What I really felt to do this morning, something different, is I felt to commission you to the harvest field. I felt to send you out the way Jesus sent his 12 disciples out. I'm going to read to you from the message. Matthew chapter 9, and we'll go into Matthew chapter 10, but Matthew 9 says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news of the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless. This is true of any time in history. Without Jesus, they're confused and helpless. Not that they don't do good things or can't do good things. But without Jesus, their inward compass is messed up. Like sheep without a shepherd. He says to to the disciples, he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Who's in charge of the harvest? The Lord. Ask him to send more workers into the field. Verse 1 of chapter 10 That prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the right fields. He gave them power to kick out evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. You're an answer to that prayer this morning, church. He's given you the power to kick out evil spirits and tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. Somewhere along the line, I think that we misperceive his invitation. John 5, 17 says, Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. The invitation is for us to join him. Sometimes we have it backwards. Sometimes it goes something like this. Hey, Father, I've been thinking about helping you advance your kingdom. I think I can help you in that. Here's a five-page business plan I'd like to present to you. I'm stepping out here, taking a risk. I'd really like you to back me up. I don't want to look foolish. I don't want to fail. I don't want to look bad. I need you to help me. When Bonnie and I sold our life dream and fully immersed ourselves in helping people grow in the kingdom, it was a little more along those lines. Help me, Father, as I step out for you. I remember one night in a prayer room with a bunch of other leaders. It was one of those late night prayers and we were praying and I was reminding the Lord of the sacrifice that I was making for him. Just in case he didn't know. Just in case he didn't realize how close and dear it was to my heart. And I began to verbalize the things that I'm giving up. And then his response was, you're talking about these little things? You follow me and I'll release these things in your life. Sometimes in reality, we look at our life as a movie. Hmm. I'm the main character, the star of the show. You're my supporting cast. You can help me fill, fulfill what God is doing. It's me-centered. Even if it's God's focus, it's more about you helping me fulfill and write the movie. When in reality, God is already a millennium into the movie, and he's asking you for a cameo appearance. He was working here in this region before you were born. He'll be working here long after you leave. He's inviting you to be part of his masterpiece. He already has a vision. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. He already has the plan. Make disciples of every nation. In reality, his request to me in 1986, as I look back on it, was this. Ron, I'm planning a major move here in this region. It'll have a global impact. Would you be willing to sell your life dream and come and help me? Or shall I look for someone else? I can look for someone else. It's up to you. Would you just show up 
and work with me for a season. That's speaking to someone here. As I was praying through my message this morning, I wrote down, Selah, wait, wait. God is creating his masterpiece here in the region. And he's asking you individually as well as collectively to join him in the script of seeing his kingdom come and seeing this region change. Will you respond to that invitation? Holy Spirit. First of all, let me clarify, I'm not saying you have to give up a life dream. That's just what Jesus asked me if I was willing to do. I'm not the standard. He may be asking you to pursue a life dream that you've had in the back burner and you've been afraid to launch. He may be asking you to step out in faith in something that you've been afraid to step out in before. It may be something as insignificant as to volunteer at the food bank. Seemingly insignificant. Bonnie owns a, it's my wife Bonnie, owns a certain part of the town that we live close to. She walks certain blocks a number of times a week. She didn't really hardly know anybody on those walk on that walk but as she was praying and prays through that those blocks every week we run into people who live on those blocks what a restaurant where do you live i live down on railroad street really i'll pray for you where do you live i happen to live in carpenter really i walk that a couple times a week how can i pray for you Nine years ago, she was walking through the one area and there was a third grader playing in the park, calling Johnny. She reached out to Johnny and her first thought was, where are your parents? Is it okay for you to be out here? She began to develop a relationship. Again, let's call him Johnny. Johnny happened to live on those blocks. She'd walk past, the first time she walked past and saw him coming out of the house. <gasps> Hi, Johnny! She just loved him so much to the degree that when she'd walk past the house, they would yell out of the house, there goes Bonnie! She began friends with mom, friends with the other children. Fast forward, Johnny graduated last year, and Bonnie just was talking to someone else the other day, last week, this week, this past week, and she said, by the way, did you know Johnny wants to come to celebration on Sunday? It took nine years for that to take place, and there were a lot of other things, a lot of the other details in that, but the relationships, ladies and gentlemen, will pay off as you're faithful. Matthew 10, verse 5, Jesus gives instructions as he sends out the disciples. And I want to unpack that for you this morning. He says this, he said, again, message. I love the verbalization of the message version. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. What Jesus is saying, start with what's in front of you. Start small. The biggest football player that you'll be watching this afternoon started between probably 7 and 10 pounds. The biggest ministry that you see started much smaller. Dove itself started in a living room. 
with less than 30 people. Sometimes we hear big names talk, quote unquote, and share huge stories, and we want to start there. It doesn't start there. Starts small, starts faithful. Remember, stay in tune with the Father, advance the kingdom, stay focused on others, pour out of the abundance God has given you to build the kingdom. Mark Batterson writes in his book, Chase the Lion, he said, games, this football game that many of you will be watching today is not one on the field. It's one in the weight room, in the film room, in the locker room. He writes, you can't just pray as it depends solely on God. You have to also work as if it depends on you. It's your work ethic plus your prayer ethic that will inch you closer to your dream. And it happens, one practice, one day at a time. You get into shape, one workout at a time. You get out of debt, one payment at a time. You grow in faith, one experience at a time. You understand God's plan and purpose, one revelation at a time. You become more free in ministry with one encounter at a time. You feel more comfortable praying for healing, one prayer at a time. You become more free talking to strangers, one stranger at a time. You become efficient praying for deliverance one breakthrough at a time. And you become more intimate with Jesus one encounter at a time. But you have to do the time. You have to do the time. When I caught the revelation of fasting, I was a farmer. Working 12, 14 hours days. Hard work. But I wanted to fast. I really felt I needed to incorporate that in my life. So I started with one meal. Whew, that was hard. And then I was able to do that. Let's go to one day. Wow, that was rugged. But then I got to the place where, okay, I can go one day. That's all right. But then it got to every day that I would fast, something would happen. Equipment would break. Cows would get out. Something would happen. I could count on it. I'd be like, oh, rats, I'm going to fast next week. I wonder what's going to happen. And maybe I was inviting it. I don't know. But it was in that setting when I said, Lord, I don't understand. He said, fast the second day and I'll break it. Two days? Go two days? You realize what I'm doing here. You realize the work that I have to do here. Fast two days. I'll break it. I'm in. Until fasting became a part of my lifestyle. When I was pastoring, leading the church as Alan did, for a season, I would fast from Thursday night to Sunday afternoon every week. And then it got to the place, listen, started out with a word from the Lord, and then it got to the place where I was depending on that. And the Lord knew it, and he said, Ron, you're trusting in your fasting more than you are in me. I said, no, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not. He said, well, then today, this week, I want you to eat. Oh, I can't do that, because it won't. Sunday's going to Sunday's gonna crash if I don't fast. See? You're trusting in a religious action instead of in my spirit. In the book, Boys of Summer, Roger Kuhn talks about George Shuba, who I've never heard of before. He's a famous baseball player back in the 50s. Roger said, George swings his bat as natural as a smile. George laughed and showed him a book, and he said, off-season, this is what happens off-season. I take a 44-ounce bat, and I swing it every evening 60 times. And then I put an X on the paper. And then when I have 10 Xs on the paper, I go to bed. That's 600 swings a night. 4,200 swings a week. 47,200 swings in the off season. He did the time. In Breaking Barriers to Growth, it teaches the best way to grow a church is to grow people. Let me ask you a question this morning. I drove past a lot of farms. I'm a farmer by trade. I look at dirt a lot. If I'm in Africa, I look at dirt. If I'm in 
Europe, I look at dirt, just who I am. But I look at two things. I look at how much can that dirt produce and how can we get it to produce more. Those are my thought patterns, how they're handling the harvest, so to speak. And I bring that into the kingdom as well. So the question for you this morning is, do the farmers in this county, in this region, grow corn and beans? No, they don't. They plant corn and beans. The corn and beans effectively grow themselves. Listen, I can't make it grow, but I can create an environment for you to grow. I've heard, and maybe you've said to yourself, I'm just not being fed. Really? Do you have a Bible? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Then you have what you need to grow. I'm not making any excuse for any bad sermons. All I'm saying is, I can't blame anyone else for my immaturity. I can't blame anyone else for my life decisions. I can't blame anyone else for my responses to life situations. I'm just saying. We have this huge tree in our backyard. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's killing the, gra- killing the grass underneath. I've never fed that thing. It grows on its own. Place yourself in an environment that will cause you to grow. The things that Alan and Teen make available to you, place yourself in that environment. There's times I accept the responsibilities that the know the Lord is asking me to do because it will drive me to him. It will cause me to draw from him like never before because I need him. I need his grace upon my life. Newsflash. The environment that causes you to grow is not a stress-free environment. I forget who it was. I don't know his name. I know his face. But I don't remember his name. He said this. He said, the Christian life is not meant to be hard. It's meant to be impossible without the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. In other words, start around you. Start around you. Hmm. I remember sitting over coffee with a young man who said, I feel called to be a missionary. I want to go to X Nation and work with college students. I said, that's amazing. How are you working with college students here? Oh, I can't relate to college students here. Well, if you can't relate to college students, it's like a revelation for him. I said, well, if you're unable to relate to college students in this nation, how do you think you'll be able to relate to college students in another nation? Start where you're at. Start with what's in front of you. Verse 7, tell them the kingdom is here. Bring, the, bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables. Oh, I love that phrase. That's why I said I love this verbiage, touch the untouchables. There are untouchables all around you. You'll see them in the mini market. You'll see them in the grocery store. I see them on the plane, wherever they are. They're doing things that say, notice me, whether it's a piercing, that, not all those are because they want to be noticed. Some of them just like it. But if I see someone that's really on the, how should I say, excessive side of those things, I do the very thing they're asking, and that is notice me. Notice me. I had wonderful conversations. As I reach out to those who are on the edge, as Jesus says, touch the untouchables. <laughs> Kick out demons. Next part of verse 6. And you guys do this so well here. But let me bring one clarification. Casting out demons is not limited to a ministry. That is practical Christianity for every believer. Do you hear me? Yes, praise God for ministries. Praise God for what you have here for for Janie and and what's happening here. It's amazing. I love it. I love the stuff they're doing. I love all the foundational things and the, the teaching. It's excellent. But if you encounter someone in your daily walk, in the cubicle next to you that you know has a stronghold in their life and the door is open, step through it and say, can I pray for you? Can we see this thing broken over your life? 
Remember, stay tuned with the Father. Advance the kingdom. Stay focused on others. And pour out of the abundance God has given you. <laughs> Verse 9, don't think you have to put on a fundraising campaign before you start. You don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. When I read that verse, something leaped inside of me for you. You are the equipment. You are a tool. God has given you tools. The nine spiritual gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gifts of faith, gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, tongues, interpretations of tongues, discerning of spirits and prophecy are his gifts to you, his tools to you so that you can be a tool in his hand. He's the master mechanic. And he's giving you those tools so that you can be effective to others. He gives you the tools. He is a master mechanic. Let me close. Two things. Two things that will, if you grasp these, I believe will release you in everything I've said thus far. Number one, you cannot die. Death is defeated, church. You cannot die. You may leave this life for a better one, but you cannot die. Conquer your fear of death. I'm speaking out to myself as much as anybody else. But you cannot die. You can leave this life for a better one, but you cannot die. The second one, and this you... <laughs> I, we, need to totally understand and totally embrace, and that is you are never alone. Never. No matter how alone you, how alone you feel, no matter what you're encountering, you are never alone. It's impossible for you to be alone. When you made Jesus Lord of your life, he came and he will never leave. It is impossible for you to be alone. He's with you regardless. No matter how heavy the situation, you are not alone. You cannot die. You are not alone. Let me close with this. I said, and toward the beginning, praise God for what he's doing here at Grace. The food bank, all the things I mentioned, all the ministries you're involved in, that, they are wonderful, they're amazing. But I believe the real horsepower of what God wants to do within this region is here in this room. Each of you fulfilling God's plan and purpose for your life. I'm going to do two things. Number one, I said somewhere along the line about public confession. Is there anyone that you... You just want to make a public confession. I'm not saying you say anything out loud necessarily, but you just want to declare Jesus is Lord of your life. You've already made, you've already accepted him as Savior, but you want to declare that. Just stand. If there's anybody here, you just, I just want to make a public declaration. All right? Great. Praise God. Public declaration. There's just something powerful about that. Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, I surrender to you. I declare. King of kings and Lord of lords, I surrender to you in Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. You can be seated. Alan, I'm going to turn it back to you. I think there was two things I wanted to do, but I don't remember, remember what the second one was. So. <laughs> God wants to use you. Ephesians 5 very clearly states the saints are called to do the work of ministry. Praise God for ministries, but God wants to use you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Ron. Would you stand to your feet as we get ready to go? I just want to release you and bless you this morning. Um, if you've been touched, if you've been, the Spirit's been speaking to you this morning, then respond to him right? The worst thing we can do is hear and be impacted and inwardly say yes and then not respond and do anything that follows that up. So if the Lord has put something on your heart today, 
seek out, to take that step forward, whatever that is. Let's pray. I just want to bless you today. Before we do our offering, I just want to bless you. Father, thanks. You love us so much that you bless us with yourself. Above and beyond all the things that we could have or accumulate or acquire, it's you that we're learning becomes the most important thing to us. So Lord, I just bless these today, your people, your sons, your daughters. I just bless them that in turn they would be a blessing to others as they leave this place. They would look for opportunities to reach out, opportunities to pray, opportunities to give, opportunities to release what you're doing in them and through them to expand your kingdom wherever you take each individual. This body of believers, everyone in this room, to the work of ministry, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. We release them to effectively be a tool in your hands. We commission them today in Jesus' precious name. Amen.